This type of technology, we're talking about wireless telegraphy, was in its infancy. During the day, a signal could go 500 miles. At night, it bounced off the ionosphere and could go 2,000 miles. So this had this strange effect where David Sarnoff is sitting on top of Wanamaker's department store in New York in the middle of the night in a wireless room, falling asleep when his headset goes off, and he gets the signals actually from Titanic saying she's sinking. So he relays that to the New York Times, which is a nothing paper. The New York Times gets a scoop of the century. Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, where we look at the forgotten, neglected, strange, and even counterfactual stories that made our world what it is. I'm your host, Scott Rank. 160 minutes. That's all the time rescuers would have before the largest ship in the world slipped beneath the Atlantic. When the Titanic hit an iceberg... There was amazing heroism and astounding incompetence against the backdrop of the most advanced ship in history sinking with some of the richest and most famous people on board. It's a story of a network of wireless operators on land and sea who desperately sent messages back and forth across the dark, frozen northern Atlantic to mount a rescue mission. More than 28 ships would be involved in the rescue of Titanic survivors along with four different countries. Now, the heroes of the story of the Titanic are seemingly well-known, such as the captain, but a lot of that has to do with the publication of the 1950s book, A Night to Remember. Today's guest is here to add a lot more nuance to the story of the Titanic, and that's William Hazelgrove. He's the author of the new book, 160 Minutes, The Race to Save the RMS Titanic. At the heart of the rescue are two young Marconi operators, Jack Phillips, who is 25, and Harold Bride, who is 22. The Marconi was a primitive radio, and technologically it was at the point that personal computers were in the 1980s. They tapped furiously and sent electromagnetic waves into the night as the room they sat in slanted toward the depths, and they didn't stop until the water was around their ankles. Then they plunged into the water after coordinating the largest rescue operation the maritime world had ever seen and saved 710 people by their efforts. Now, as we know, most people on the Titanic died, approximately 1,500. So Hazelgrove argues that the only reason that every single person on the ship didn't die is because of Jack Phillips and Harold McBride tapping out distress codes while the ship took on water at a rate of 400 tons per minute. Sadly also, as Hazelgrove argues, if the closest ships to the Titanic had acted more decisively and been willing to risk itself slightly with the icy flows nearby, every single person on the Titanic could have been saved. So this is unpacking a lot we think we know about the story of the Titanic, and it's eye-opening in a lot of ways. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with William Hazelgrove. Bill, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, you are perhaps one of the most prolific guests I have. Your output rivals all except perhaps Isaac Asimov. But with quantity, does not cause a diminishment in quality. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the Titanic. Something I'm curious about, first of all, is what your understanding of maybe the main takeaway of the story of the Titanic before you began to research. Because from what I understand, when I learned the story in grade school, the takeaway is sort of the hubris of man that he could build something unsinkable. Then, of course, the Titanic sinks. But then after the James Cameron movie was released and it talked about class conflict and some people in first class forcibly causing those in steerage not to be able to escape, there was pushback against the movie for people who said, no, there are incredible stories of bravery, stoicism in the face of death, the British stiff upper lip. And this is contrasted with things like the 2012 Italian ship, the Costa Concordia, where the captain ran away before everyone else was evacuated and he's blasted as a coward compared to those on the Titanic who are drinking sherry and making sure the women and children are safe as they accept their doom. But what was your impression of the story of the Titanic before you sat down to research your book? Honestly, I was probably one of those people who watched the movie and was just smitten with it and thought, wow, this is fantastic. So my knowledge of Titanic was very general, but like all my books, I wanted to find something that was maybe under the surface, but I wasn't quite sure what it would be. In fact, my feeling was that everything had been written about Titanic. And it was always sort of a hope that one day I might find some angle, if you will, on the ship sinking. So I started to actually read about the Marconi operators. And that led to a whole different side of Titanic that I didn't know about, which was a rescue mission. There was actually a rescue mission that involved 10 ships, was extensive. They had 160 minutes to get to Titanic. 
So that's obviously the name of the book is 160 Minutes. So the race was really on to go and try and get the Titanic before she sank. And because we all know about Carpathia, which is the one ship that made it. And we can talk about that a little more. But there was so much more going on. And then, of course, there is the great heartbreaking stories of the Mount Temple in the California that really made me rethink Titanic and start to strip away the mythology that I had heard all my life. And I think most people have. And that is one of sort of the great patriarchal white males up on the deck, putting their wives and children into the boat as they have a brandy, a cigar and send them off. And also the Greek tragedy aspect of it, which is it was preordained that, that they were out there on the North Atlantic by themselves and that there was nothing anybody could do. And the best they could do was be heroic and chivalrous. So once you say that, well, then it's the pantheon of the Titanic looms Titanic. But if you say that outcome wasn't preordained, that in fact, it, everyone could have been saved. Well, now you're starting to crack the mythology of Titanic open. Right. And I want to get to your uh, main thesis. But first of all, could you tell me about the Marconi operators? Because my memory is probably incorrect. But when I learned about Titanic in grade school, I think there was a point that it fired off fireworks uh, to signal distress and the Carpathia saw it, but maybe they misinterpreted it or thought it was a party as if there wouldn't be clear signals with maritime law about what signal is what. I mean, that makes sense to a 10 year old, but as an adult, if I rethink that narrative, I realize that doesn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. But Marconi operators were never mentioned. So can you just uh, mention them briefly since they do play a large part in your telling? Absolutely. Wireless telegraphy at that point was the same as the personal computer was in the 1980s. Um, a lot of people didn't understand it. It was new technology, sort of nerds inhabited the sphere of the early PCs. Well, the same thing with wireless. Let's take Marconi set that was on the Titanic, the most powerful one ever made. Two operators, Jack Phillips, Harold Bride, 20 something. They work for Marconi. They have nothing to do with White Star. So technically they aren't even under the ships. They speak a whole different language, uh, sort of a prep school jargon, old man, hey, say old man, all this. But mostly they understand wireless telegraphy and they understand Morse code. Nobody else on the ship understands this at all. In fact, Captain Smith, it is his last voyage. So this is his crowning moment of taking this ship across. And he believes after 30 years, he knows best. And he views wireless the way a lot of people did is this technology where passengers could send a letter, a missive to New York and say, hey, I'll meet you for lunch. Or this ship is beautiful. Or they could get the news. News would actually be downloaded, if you will, from, say, Cape Race, which is at Newfoundland. And so these messages would come in. And so if somebody could have a croissant and a coffee in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and read a newspaper because the, they had their own press on the Titanic. So this is the way it was viewed. It was not viewed as this great life-saving device. It was really viewed as sort of an extra gadget that Captain Smith really didn't regard as critical to his navigation, even though they were being bombarded with ice warnings. Smith kept, the, as he famously, kept the boilers fired up. He was trying to go for a record time to New York, and they went steaming into this ice field full speed ahead. Well, yeah, thank you for that prologue here, because that is very important. So let's get to the meat of it right away. What is your main argument about the sinking of the Titanic? And why is your claim seemingly so surprising to those who've never heard it before? Well, Titanic mythology has been pretty iron tight ever since Walter Lord's book came out in 1955, which is a night to remember. He was a copywriter. He went and interviewed all the survivors. And that 112-page book became the Bible of every Titanic book that followed. And every Titanic book is Walter Lord's book, these interviews with the survivors. It wasn't wrong. It's just where he decided to put his camera. He decided to say, you are there. So it's a voyeuristic journey of Titanic sinking. Well, that set the stage for every study, history, movie that followed. Walter Lord's scenes are in the movie Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. But there is another story, and this involves human failing. Okay, when I say human failing, I'm talking about really two captains, Captain Lord and Captain Moore. Now, Captain Lord was with the California. 
Captain Loaded stopped his ship less than 10 miles away from Titanic because he hit the ice field. And he said, I'm not going any further. Now, he's a very imperious captain. His word is law. His officers are on the bridge. More goes to bed. Also, his wireless operator has gone to bed. Meanwhile, they've hit the iceberg. They're sinking. Captain Smith tells his passengers, see that light over there? That's a ship rowed toward it. Now, when you read the accounts, the letters, the diaries, which is what I use for Titanic, you start to hear these all this talk about the light, the light that they were told to row toward it. And multiple people saw this light. So that's how close California was. So literally, you had people rowing toward this ship that never gets any closer because it's actually just drifting. They start morsing this ship, trying to get it to respond. It doesn't. The, the officers on the bridge of the California see Titanic, and they say, that ship looks really strange. And they call down to Captain Lord and say, look, there's this ship. We think it might be Titanic. And Lord says, no, that's not Titanic. That's some kind of fishing trawler or some other ship. But he does stop and ask the wireless operator, who's taken off its set, turned it off, says, are there any ships in the area? He says, only Titanic. Still, Lord does not believe this. Okay, so it gets worse. They see rockets going off. So Titanic is now in full distress and starts sending off rockets. Rockets, it's seeming only one thing. Distress, come quickly, we need help. It doesn't matter what color they are, they're white. Now, Captain Lord, again, has woken up. They said, sir, we see rockets. The ship is sending off rockets. He says, what color are they? They say they're white. He says, let me know if it changes. And he, he doesn't even come up onto the bridge. So basically, these officers of the California are watching the Titanic sink in front of them. Meanwhile, on the far side of the ice field is Captain Moore with the Mount Temple. Now, he got the signal, the CQD, come quick distress, right away. And, and so he came really fast, and he's the first one actually to reach Titanic. But he hits the ice field, and he told his passengers, do not go up top. Do not go on top of the ship, regardless of anything. Don't go up there. Well, a bunch of passengers sneak up. It's freezing out. They look out into the darkness. And by the way, this is a night, a crystal clear night. And the Atlantic Ocean is a mill pond, a million stars. They go up on top, the top of the deck. They're freezing. But what do they see? They see a ship sinking, shooting off rockets. The crew sees the ship sinking, shooting off rockets. They implore Captain Moore to go on. He says, no, I'm not going to risk my ship. The crew considers mutiny. But still, he doesn't do it. In fact, he starts to back away. So you have these two ships on either side of Titanic, where one ship is saying, I'm not going to even recognize this as Titanic. And literally, they get up more, back to the California, they get him up several times. He finally says, look, that is not Titanic. End of story. So the officers watch Titanic sink. They watch it basically disappear in front of them. Captain Moore, he pulls away and goes on the far side of the ice field. Titanic sinks with only the Carpathia, which is 50 miles away, coming full speed, that has a chance to get there. So we're talking about Captain Rostrum. And Captain Rostrum is what everybody wants to be. He's the hero of this night, along with the two wireless operators. He does come full speed. He does zigzag around icebergs. He does get his ship all rigged up to take on passengers. He arrives an hour late, about 3, 320. Titanic's gone. He sees somebody shoot off a flare in a lifeboat. He looks. And so there is the moment where he realizes Titanic's gone. The best he can do is pick up the 700 passengers in the lifeboats. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'm curious about these two captains that decide not to mount a rescue operation because of the ice field, how much of maritime protocol are they following? Is it understood that if you're going to put your own vessel in grave danger, you don't do this even to save another one because you might very well sink two ships and save one, or are they being unduly cautious or some might even say cowardly? So how justified are they in their actions, do you think? Well, actually, they aren't justified at all. 
whenever you see rockets at sea, it means come quick distress. We are in dire need of your assistance. Now, the Captain Moore had actually received the CQD saying, come quickly, we're sinking, we're putting off women and children. So they knew this. Captain Lord, obviously they could see this ship shooting off rockets. Now, just to jump ahead a little bit, when they do have the inquiry in the United States, Captain Lord is pulled into that, and they basically convict him, saying, you should have come to the assistance of Titanic. He tried to double talk and say there was an, another ship there, that there was a mystery ship. This will bring all sorts of new conspiracy theories that exist to this day. But they kept asking him, and this is where I got a lot of my information from the, the testimony at the Senate trial or the Senate investigation. They kept drilling him saying, what do rockets at sea mean? And he said, well, it depends what color they are. And they said, but what does that matter? What does it mean if a ship say of rockets? Finally, he said, it means distress. Come help me. So they had him there. And again, to this day, there's what's called Lordites, people who believe he was unfairly scapegoated for the Titanic. But the truth is, he was within 10 miles. He was sitting there. And he made a decision not to risk his neck to go into that ice field. Now, how did he finally find out that this was, in fact, the Titanic? At about 4 a.m., one of the officers had enough and went down and woke up the wireless operator. All right, so wireless is a device where you have to turn it on, crank it up, get it you know, sort of revved up, if you will, to be able to send this sort of high-voltage signals out. Titanic had two operators, which was 24 hours the California had one. So he would go to bed. And so basically their ears, if you will, were off. So when they wake him up, he goes on, he says, what's going on out there? And immediately he's bombarded with Titanic sunk, Titanic sunk. So he goes to Captain Lord and says, sir, the Titanic sunk last night. I think that was that ship. And, and Lord says, that can't be true. I need verification. And so he gets it. And then Lord finally realizes that in fact, that was Titanic. And he does a slow boat to China rescue operation where he comes at about five or six in the morning to to nothing. And there's Carpathia's already taken up the passengers, pulled up the lifeboats. So he's he's very late to that party. But this is the type of technology that was in its infancy. And just to give you an idea how unknown this technology was, during the day a signal could go five hundred miles. We're talking about wireless telegraphy. At night, it bounced off the ionosphere and could go 2,000 miles. So this had this strange effect where David Sarnoff is sitting on top of Wanamaker's department store in New York in the middle of the night in a wireless room, falling asleep when his headset goes off, and he gets the signals actually from Titanic saying she's sinking. So he relays that to the New York Times, which is a nothing paper. The New York Times gets a scoop of the century. Also, it goes in as far as New Jersey, where four boys are huddled around. A lot of young people had these sets, sort of like shortwave radios, and their parents have gone to bed. They've strung an antenna on their roof. And this is, you know, in the way I know about this, is this, this was reported on the papers. So they're sitting there, and suddenly their set lights up, and they get the signals from Titanic saying she's sinking, hit an iceberg, come quick. They go tell their parents, don't believe them. They say that ship's unsinkable. There is no way that you, one, you could hear these signals, two, that ship could sink. But of course, they did hear the signals and Titanic had sunk. That's interesting. It's sort of like people in the 1980s ARPANET finding out information way ahead of time if how early this technology is. Well, I want to hear about the point you make that it's because of these Marconi operators that the number that are rescued are even able to be rescued. But I'd like to pursue an interesting line of thought, and that is... Based on the argument, if everyone could have been saved, what does this alternate history look like? Does the California or the Mount Temple simply go through the ice flows, pick up the those who are entering lifeboats, or what does it look like? Okay, so let's say everything worked the way it was supposed to that night. Everybody acted the way they were supposed to. Captain Lord would have approached because his officers quickly saw it. Let's say Lord wasn't there. Their officers would have gone straight to that ship. They would have had to get there. They would have picked up the people from the boats. Obviously, they would have stood by and tried to offload as many people as they could on Titanic before she went down. Now, Titanic is going down fairly quickly. 
So this could be tricky. But at the least, let's say worst case scenario, all of those people, the 1,500 people went into the water, they could start pulling them out of the water. You know, they could throw down lines. They could, after they unloaded the boats, they could send, you know, go out with crew to get the boats. Now let's talk about the people in the boats because my rescue scenario is really sort of a triumvirate. All right, you have Captain Moore, Captain Lord. Now you have 705 first-class passengers in 20 boats. And these boats are all strung out around Titanic as she's sinking. So they're literally watching Titanic sink. Now, the dirty secret is these boats were loaded way below capacity. They could hold 75 people because there'd never been a lifeboat drill, because they were first class, because a lot of people thought they'd be coming back. A lot of people didn't believe Titanic was going to sink. These boats were loaded with, say, at times 10 people, 20, 30, 40, when they could hold, they could hold 75 people. They were very heavy reinforced boats. Now, the boats in total could hold about 1175, and I think it was 705 people were in there. So you're talking 400 people could have been pulled out if they had gone back. Now, we talk about breaking apart Titanic mythology. We've got the band playing. We've got the first class setting off the women and children. Everybody's acting very chival in very chivalrous manner. But this little dirty secret is humans not acting the way we would like them to do. So what happens? The people go into the water. There's 1,500 of the people in the water at once, which a lot of, when you read these testimonies, people say they sounded like locusts on a summer night. They sounded like when a ball game, when a ball gets hit. But the worst description was that it was all a long death moan in the same pitch. People couldn't stand to listen to it. They covered their ears. They sang. But some of the people said, let's go back. Let's go back and, and our boats are only half full. Let's rescue some of these people. Other people in the boat said, no, the swamp us will die too. We aren't going back. Molly Brown famously wanted to go back. But everybody in the boat said no. One boat did go back, rescued four people, but basically they were too late. So these first class people, the cream of society, sitting in these boats, watched these 1,500 people drown and did not return. So, so this is, again, this goes against the mythology of Titanic, which is sort of you know, it painting these very sort of Swinburnian hues of this almost a romantic ideal and certainly the movie Titanic was a very romantic movie, but this is people not acting the way we think they should. And so this would be part of that rescue. These people could have picked up to 400 people. Even if they picked up half of that, it would have been 200 people. So Captain Moore could have come in from one side. Captain Lord could have come in from the other. The people in the lifeboats could have picked up the rest. At the least, you would have probably rescued 80% of that 1,500 people that died in the water. Yeah, you're saying even if the lifeboats had done what they were supposed to and filled them at or maybe even slightly over capacity to pick up to pile on as many people as they could before the lifeboats were obviously overflowed. Is that accurate? Absolutely. So uh, get, before uh, getting into what Jack Phillips and Harold McBride did, something I'm curious about is why do you think this version of the story hasn't been told? And you mentioned the influence of A Night to Remember, but... The story of the Titanic, it's not a cautionary tale of safety protocol of these other two ships overriding simple common sense or people not stepping back or maybe the people behaving in ways that they shouldn't be behaving, as you said. I wonder, like, is it simply because the narrative cast by A Night to Remember is so strong that it's hard for people to push back? And if that is the case, what that reminds me of is recently a family member of mine mentioned just that this was conventional wisdom, that in the Middle Ages, everyone thought the earth was flat. And I hated to be that guy, but, you know, it is my job, so here I am. And I said, <laughs> well, actually, and I didn't say it like that. I was kind. I said, well, no one believed that. I mean, go back to ancient Alexandria. Aristophanes established with pretty good accuracy that the world was round. Everyone knew it. Astronomy doesn't make sense if the world is flat. That was just a thing that Washington Irving said in a biography on Christopher Columbus in the 1800s because he wanted to make Columbus a hero. Everyone thought the world was flat. So a thing that a guy wrote became conventional wisdom. It was taught to my relative as fact in her public school in the 1960s. And this is just a thing that a guy wrote. And specialists are still pushing back against this for Middle Ages. So I wonder, do you think something similar is at work here with Titanic mythology? 
Oh, absolutely. History is mythology a lot of times. My other books, Madam President, The Secret Presidency of Edith Wilson, Wright Brothers, Wrong Story. The same thing was in play. Why do, why do not more people know about Edith Wilson taking over and running the United States from 1919 to 1921? Well, because nobody said it. And all the Wilson historians would dance around it, but they'd never change it. Most historians sort of amplify what's already been established. Wright Brothers, Wrong Story. A guy named Fred Kelly wrote the biography in 1942 that... Orville had come up with, and Wilbur had been dead 30 years. And so we got that canard that they were 50% partners when, in fact, Wilbur invented that plane. But that mythology has stuck. Well, same thing with Titanic. It began actually before Lord. It began when the tragedy occurred. Okay, Titanic goes down. They had no information. Okay, nothing's coming back to them. Newspapers are guessing. Well, they had to create stories because they didn't know anything. So one of the things they created was the heroic ideal, the great white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heroic ideal of Captain Smith, for one, going down with the ship, but also saying, be British, holding a baby at the end, waving on, he he reportedly swam up to a, a boat full of people. And when he saw there was no room, he said, no, no, boys, I'm good. And then he swam away. All right. The reason they're doing this is because This tragedy at this time in history, hard for us to believe, was unprecedented. This massive loss of life was unprecedented. We have mega death in the 21st century, 20th century, where you've gotten used to it. But at this time, this was unbelievable. So they had to make sense of it, almost in a religious context. And so they did. They created the heroic ideal uh, where everybody acted heroically. Then they just made up what they didn't know. Captain Smith, let's take him for example. Basically, the reality was he was like a duck hit on the head. He had given an interview famously before the sinking where he said, shipwrecks are a thing of the past. Technology is such that ships are unsinkable. Now, let's talk about Titanic unsinkable. Titanic had watertight bulkheads. We know this from the movie. It's a big famous thing. The problem was the watertight bulkheads only went up to EDAC. Okay, so Titanic hits the iceberg, it scrapes along the side, floods five compartments. Titanic could float with four. But after five, think of a canoe where the bow is filling up with water, and it becomes an anchor and starts pulling it down. Well, the water then goes up and over the bulkheads. Think of you sitting in your living room, and you're, you leave the window open in a big storm in your bedroom, and you think, I'm good, I'm in my living room. Well, your bedroom fills up with water, it comes over the ceiling and drops into your living room. This is basically what happened to Titanic, and it started to just pull it down by the head. So the mythology of Titanic actually started right then, where the newspapers had to make it heroic. They had to make things up. They didn't get any real information until Harold Bride made it back on Carpathia. And of course, the New York Times grabbed him and scooped that story. And that's, by the way, what made the New York Times the New York Times. Also, the Times had, had just an aside had taken a gamble. A lot of papers were saying, this shows you how much disinformation there was. Most of the newspapers said Titanic was fine, that she was being towed to Halifax. And actually, they even chartered a train for all the survivors to go to Halifax and meet everybody from the Titanic. So all these newspapers are saying she's fine. New York Times takes a gamble. They said, no, she sank. And it's a horrible loss of life. Even though they weren't sure, he took a gamble. And this made the New York Times the New York Times. So this mythology that's handed down, and as you said, in your comparison, the world is flat, became very powerful. Walter Lord's book comes out, sort of amplifies it by putting forth the survivor stories. And it, that's only a 112-page book, okay? A Night to Remember is only 112 pages of basically accounts by the survivors. And that's what makes it so much fun to read. But is there a critical intelligence involved there of questioning even these survivor accounts? No, absolutely not. Let's take the band playing. All right, so the band playing is very integral to Titanic mythology. Well, in 1965, one of the survivors, a woman said, that's ridiculous. She said, first of all, the ship was at this incredible angle, 45 degree angle, nobody could stand. And she said, second of all, it was so cold, the strings of the instruments would break. But here's the real thing. Third of all, she said, you couldn't hear anything. Why? They had 24 boilers on the Titanic. Okay, for your listeners, this is a steam-driven machine. And so it has a big piston engine, right? So you, the more steam you have, the faster those pistons turn. Well, the Titanic was going full speed when she hit that ice field. 
about 23 knots. Every boiler is lit up. And I mean, they're shoveling in coal. So there's a massive amount of pressure. So then she comes to a dead stop. Well, that steam has to go somewhere. So they release it through the funnels. The accounts of it say it was like 100 locomotives in a train station. They said you couldn't hear yourself think. Second officer Lightoller said you couldn't communicate except by hand signals. So all that conversation you see in the movie of Titanic, that could never have occurred because you couldn't hear anything. So this also contributed to confusion, which we, we can talk about more, sort of, you know, the breakdown, if you will, any sort of rules on Titanic, but in, in probably the, the loading of the lifeboat. And certainly this goes against the mythology that was handed down, a, a more orderly moment where people are getting off in the boats. It's sort of under control. In fact, there was chaos on the Titanic, but mythology is strong. So when you come against it, you're going to hit headwinds every time. I've never looked at original sources about the Titanic, except for accounts that are well-known and reprinted online or things that you can find on archive.org and that nature, some of the lowest hanging fruit. For someone who's looked at original sources, is this narrative pretty easy to see based on what you've researched if one has the eyes to see? Yeah, I mean, I got a lot of blowback when I wrote Wright Brothers' Ron story, but all the aviation heavyweights backed me up, and so did the Smithsonian Magazine when I wrote an article for them. What I do is I look at it logically, and I don't start out to prove a point. I always stumble upon the story, and that's exactly what happened with Titanic. I was reading it, and it just occurred to me, oh, this is a story of human failing. This is not a story of Titanic being doomed and people acting heroically because she's doomed. She's all out there alone on the Atlantic. She was not. There was 10 ships barreling to get to her. There was two ships that were within distance to rescue her. Carpathia makes it an hour later. So what you have is you have a rescue operation that was partially successful. If, if those wireless operators had not got that signal out today, we would not know what happened to Titanic. But they did, and people were rescued. But the 1,500 people in the water is an indictment of the human failing that occurred with Captain Moore and Captain Lord and the people in the boat not in the lifeboats not coming back. So logically, you say, well, wait a minute. This could have come out to a whole different outcome. You, these people could have been saved. Now, there's the people on the other side, just to give you the other side, who say, oh, no, even if they'd come in, they couldn't have rescued them. They were further away than everybody said. And in fact, I deal with this on online, on Facebook, and all sorts of comments come flying at me. But what I say to them, I say is there was two inquir inquiries. One was the British inquiry and one was the United States inquiry, the Senate inquiry and the, and the British inquiry. Okay, both inquiries came to the same conclusion, that Captain Lord had been deficient that he had not come to the aid of Titanic. Okay, so that took care of him. Now, what about Captain Moore? Well, Captain Moore testified at the United States investigation, but he escaped history. They didn't, they, for some reason, it, it didn't come through to him that he did the same thing. Now, how do we even know about this? How do we know this is true? Because the passengers and the crew, even though Captain Lord told everybody, don't talk to anybody, he kind of put a gag order on everybody, they all talked to the press and they told them. And there's newspaper accounts on both sides. Captain Lord, where his crewmen themselves came and said, we saw her. There was a, a stoker who shovels in coal who came up on a break and he said, I watched Titanic sink. I, I, I saw the rockets. I saw her sink. All his officers saw it. The passengers saw it. Captain Moore on, the, on his side, the crew talked to the press. They told them. Then all the passengers told them. Famously, the passengers even wrote letters to the Senate inquiry going on in the United States saying, you should pull in Captain Moore. And they did. But again, he sort of wiggled out, but he didn't wiggle out of the 10 books that have been published since saying the Mount Temple could have rescued all those people. So he didn't escape entirely. And, you know, he denied seeing Titanic, but he also said, it's my job to keep my ship safe. And I didn't want to go into that ice field. So he kind of admitted it that way in a backhand way, that he was not going to go into that ice field. I mean, so what were these captains facing? Titanic had basically stumbled into a massive ice field 
littered with birds, littered with called growlers, small birds. And when you look out in the accounts, when I re- read them, the passenger, this guy named Lawrence Beasley, he was a school teacher, very literary, and he wrote a great book. He said it was beautiful in the morning when the sun came up, when they were, they were on Carpathia. He said all these pink icebergs surrounded them. Looked like heaven on this. There were so many of them. So Titanic had stumbled into this ice field. So what Captain Lord said was, I'm not going into that ice field. And Captain Moore said, I'm not going into that ice field. And it was simply, call it what you will, lack of courage, lack of initiative, playing it safe. The point is, in this moment of desperation, they did not go to the aid of Titanic. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Well, the editing of different history articles I've done in the past at least lets me see that this is what could be a simple story is challenged by the fact that the Titanic is sort of the 9-11 of the 20th century and that there's some really weird conspiracy theories about it, like that J.P. Morgan wanted to engineer it to kill off Benjamin Guggenheim or John Jacob Astor, and then it just gets weirder from there. But you do mention, I mean, in this narrative that there are heroes. And could you mention what Jack Phillips and Harold Bride did up until the very end, the Marconi operators, to try to save as many people as they could? Absolutely. So they're in what's called the silent room. And the silent room is insulated because they're using direct current. You know, we use alternating current now. They use direct current that will get stepped up very high to shoot out these signals. The more power, the more powerful your signal. The problem is when you use direct current that way, it's like a rifle shot going off whenever you hit that key and a big blue spark shoots out. So they insulated it so people wouldn't hear that. And they also insulated it so you could hear the signals come in. When you listen to the actual signals and you can do that, what they sounded like was it sounds like buzzes from an old radio. It's amazing they could decipher anything. Okay, so they're in this room. The captain had come down at about 11.42 and said, send out CQD. Then they sent out that in SOS. All right, so their objective immediately was to send out so many signals that somebody would pick up who's close enough. Now, think of a party line, which is an old term that telephones used to use in terms of when telephone lines were strung out into the rural circuits, everybody would be on the same line. They didn't have the capability to differentiate all these frequencies. Same thing with wireless at this time. So everybody would listen in. I mean, it's sort of like you could listen in to what other people were doing. So they kept sending out these signals, hoping somebody would just pick them up, turn their ship around and come straight for them and be close enough to get to them. So it's repetition. So you're sending out, you send, you, you never stop. It's sort of like social media on steroids. You're just sending out, sending out, sending out. And that's what they did. Yet, Here's Titanic, only 160 minutes, two hours, 40 minutes, she's going to sink, inverting as they're doing. So literally, they're bracing themselves against their table as this, as the ship is headed down for the bottom. Then the water starts coming into their room, and still they are transmitting. Then Captain Smith comes down at 220 and says, men, you've done your duty. It's every man for himself. And he leaves. They could leave then too, okay? They could go, wow, you know what? We're done. Let's see if we can survive this thing. But they don't. They stay there. They keep transmitting, even as the power is weakening. The Titanic was able to keep those dynamos rolling because those stokers stayed down there. They all died. They they stayed down there and kept steam going into those generators. So the current was sort of going dead like on an old roll circuit where it's getting fainter and fainter. But still they kept sending. Finally, it blinks out. So then Jack Phillips, Harold Bride say, that's it, we're done. They come out just when they come on the wires from a huge wave because Titanic is now literally slipping into the ocean. A huge wave comes and sweeps them away. Jack Phillips is never seen again. He dies. Harold Bride ends up under what's called a collapsible Inglehart lifeboat. It's a boat with canvas sides that was kind of cutting edge. It was sort of, there's only two of them. And in this particular lifeboat, nobody knew how to open it up, so it was upside down. So he's in the water in this upside-down Englehart that men are climbing on top of to get out of the water. That's what a lot of people did who survived. They just climbed up onto anything. So it has literally like 20 men on it. So he finally makes his way out and up on top of that Englehart, and his feet are two blocks of ice. They're literally dragging the water. He passes out, but he lets everybody know. He says, look, I think Carpathia is coming. She said she was coming full speed. She should be here within an hour, which 
you know, to these people floating around the Atlantic, because after Titanic was gone and everybody died, it took about 25 minutes to freeze to death. It's just dead silence. So these 20 boats are in the middle of the Atlantic on a freezing night. No idea if anybody's coming. And finally, he says, Carpathia is on the way. So that's their only hope. So even then, he's, he's sort of trying to help people and do that. So then once he does finally get plucked up by Carpathia, he goes on board. He passes out. And so we're, we're talking about Jack Bride here. He passes out. Well, there's only one wireless operator on the Carpathia. And the whole world wants to know what happened. Uh, the president wants to know what happened because Archie Butts, his advisor, was on Titanic. He died. So all the, the poor wireless operators overwhelmed. He can't keep up. He literally collapses at the key. Well, again, as we said before, this technology is very specialized. Nobody on Carpathia can stand in for him except Harold Bride. So they get him up and they say, can you do this? Even though his two feet are just horribly frostbitten. And he's like, yeah, I can. And so he goes down there. And so he takes over the key again and continues transmitting the whole way as Carpathia makes its way back to New York. So not only did he assist as best he could, he and Jack Phillips in, in trying to save Titanic, now trying to relay information on all who died, who didn't die. Now, this is a time, too, where Marconi has a little bit of a taint on him, if you will. Uh, Harold Bride's at the key. He gets a message from none other than Marconi himself saying, don't tell anybody what happened. I've arranged a deal for you to talk to the New York Times. This is, and this is how my book starts. This is the first chapter. I arranged a deal for you to talk to the New York Times exclusively. We'll give you $1,000, but you can't tell anybody else. So Harold basically doesn't tell anybody what happened. And he's getting all these inquiries from newspapers and all sorts of people and there's a big to-do because he sort of stonewalls a lot of people. Later, he said it was because people didn't understand Morse code. He was too busy and this and that. But in fact, when he does get back, Marconi comes on the ship, takes him off, takes him right to a hotel where he sits down with the New York Times and tells his story. New York Times runs it the next day. And it is the scoop of the century because everybody wants to know from Harold Bride, the Marconi operator, what actually happened on Titanic. What happened to Harold Bride after this? Good question. So afterward, Harold Bride went and lived with his family. His, actually, it was his sister for a while in New York, recovered. He did go back to sea. He did go back as a Marconi operator. But he, he only did it for about another eight years. And then he retired. And I think he became a salesman. Jack Phillips, he never recovered his body, but Harold Bride says he saw him when he was on that boat. He saw him slip into the water and die. So that's a little hard to ascertain if that was true or not. But certainly when we say who were the heroes of Titanic, these two young Marconi operators and then Captain Rostrum, who, all right, so we talked about what happened to Captain Lord and Captain Moore, who Captain Lord's disgrace, Captain Moore sort of slinks off. Captain Rostrum of the Carpathia is giving Congressional Medal of Honor. He's given multiple awards by the British. All sorts of groups give him awards. He has a stellar career after that. He's held up as the best of human beings in terrible situations. He was what everybody wanted to be in that moment and to think they would be there. You know, when I wrap up the book, I said, we all like to think we'll be Captain Rostrum. And then we won't be Captain Moore and, or Captain Lord, or we won't be those people in the boat not coming back. But heroes might be rarer than we think. And there's talk of pulling up uh, the wireless room from the bottom of the Atlantic right now. They've hit a snag where there's, they're having some legal problems, but the thought is that if they can get the wireless set up, there might be something still in those transmitting coils. And I say at the end of the book, it probably is that basic message they were asking all night long, which is, will you come help us? And it is a very human request. Will you come help us? And how we all react to that, that's really the story of the Titanic. All right. Well, I mean, you have, uh, I think, a lot for people to chew on uh, with this topic. And before we uh, wrap things up, are there any other points that you hope readers will take away from the book along with what you mentioned there? Yeah, you know, my books are a journey. So when you're on it, you, you're going to go through the sinking again uh, because you have to go through that sinking to understand how we ended up with the rescue operation. 
you're going to be with those wireless operators in the room. And I focus on the wireless operators on a lot of different ships. You know, these young men who are getting these signals, who are all alone, falling asleep when this all occurred, and then the people who picked it up. So what I like to do is I like to put our 21st century selves back at 1912 and put us in the driver's seat of, of how we would react to this catastrophe occurring right in front of us. And so you're in the boats too. I had a lot of accounts of people, a lot of people who were in those lifeboats and survived wrote books, memoirs, if you will. And, you know, they're harrowing. They're torn. A lot of them are torn. A lot of them are haunted by what happened. Several committed suicide. And then there are the people like uh, Second Officer Lightoller, who was literally sucked down with the ship, hit a grate in one of the funnels that led to the bowels of the ship, stuck there like a fly on a window because the water's rushing in. A boiler blows up and then catapults him back to the surface. It happens two or three times, but he survives. Then there's the story of the baker, this famous story. This baker drank a whole bottle of whiskey before he went in the water. And he spent two hours in that 20 degree water in the Atlantic and survived. And doctors have ever since tried to understand how this man survived. And the only thing I can surmise is that he drank so much whiskey, it was like antifreeze in his blood. But these are the, this is the tapestry of Titanic. And I opened Titanic, the book, where a fisherman is off the coast of New Jersey and he sees a bottle and it's got a cork in it. This is in 1915 or so. And he, he picks it up and it says, on Titanic, I'm gone, John Ware. And so people immediately assume, oh, this, this guy was going down Titanic. He wanted to let the world know what happened. He threw this bottle in. It floated around the Atlantic until this fisherman picked it up. But then when you go back and research it, there was no John Ware on Titanic. So somebody had just played a joke, thrown this in there, and thrown it out there. And that's really the story of Titanic mythology, even though this note in the bottom made it into many histories. But when you do the research, there was no person who named John Ware, who, he was from uh, Kent, no person from Kent who was on the passenger list who threw out this bottle. But again, so hopefully when you read it, you'll say, oh, this sounds to me more like what really happened, although the Titanic's a great movie. Very much the case. Well, this is an event that's perhaps more mythologized than a lot of the topics that appear on this podcast, but I appreciate you coming here, doing your best to give credit where credit is due to people who survived, but push back against the myths that have sprung up as good as they are and as inspiring as they are, that it just pays to know what the story is as best as we can ascertain it. Well, for listeners who do want to dig into more, and there is a lot more, as you alluded to in our discussion, the name of the book is... 160 Minutes, The Race to Save the RMS Titanic. Bill, thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to talking with you again on your next project. Oh, thank you for having me. All right, that is all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes for this and all my other episodes and include sources, maps, or other relevant information, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. Parthenon is the name of the podcast network that History Unplugged is a part of along with other great history shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other shows as well. If you'd like to support History Unplugged, there are two easy ways to do so. The first is to subscribe to the show on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. This really helps the show grow. The second thing is to join our membership program on Patreon. And if you do so, you can get completely ad-free episodes of the entire back catalog of the show, which is 600 episodes and growing, just go to patreon.com slash unplugged. 